think everyone's just about in. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Whitney White and I'm from the Division of Student Affairs and Parent and Family Programs at the University of Cincinnati. And we're thrilled to have you with us today to talk about all things Money Matters. Uh, we have some campus experts with us. So I'll let them all introduce themselves as well as we get going. Um, but we have a lot to share with you today and we'll be able to get your questions answered and have you have everything you need to know about all the different aspects of finances coming into college. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, Tiana, do you want to go to the next one? All right. So from Parent and Family Program, that's myself, and I'll let my colleague Diamond introduce herself in a second. But uh, Parent and Family Programs is your one stop at UC, we like to say. As a family member, you're an important part of the student experience at UC and we value your part in this process. So we are here to help you uh, year round. You can contact or call us anytime. We'll share our contact information at the end. So you'll have that, um, but I'll pass it over to Diamond. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diamond Montgomery. Um, I currently serve as the manager in our office I'm just really excited to um, have this new partnership here. I know you all get a lot of you know, informative information today, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. And Sydney, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Sydney Myman. I'm here to talk with you from the One Stop Student Service Center. Um, I'm our program director for our financial literacy program here at UC, so not just how to go about taking a student loan, um, but budgeting and planning and making smart financial choices um, is what we're all about. So happy to have everybody here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Jackson. I am uh, the bursar at the University of Cincinnati, and our office uh, generates student bills, uh, collects payments, and, uh, and helps students uh, you know, get their finances taken care of so they can complete their degrees. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiana Christman. I'm the assistant director in university housing, um, responsible for our marketing and communication efforts, as well as uh, our customer relation issues. Um, I'm happy to be here this afternoon and glad to answer any housing related questions. Thank you all so much for joining us today to talk with families. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues kick it off, but I did want to say if you have any questions while we're um, giving the presentation, you can throw those questions right in the chat at any point and we'll hang on to them until the end of the presentation and we'll make sure we get to answer all of those. So you can stick it right in the chat. All right. All right, I will go ahead and take it away for our agenda. Um, Tiana, can we flip back just one? Um, I would just wanna talk really briefly about the role of the One Stop Center at UC. Um, so the One Stop Center, it's not in incredibly intuitive exactly what that means, uh, but the One Stop Center at University of Cincinnati is really there to answer and kind of be your front line for financial related questions, as well as some registration and registrar related matters. So we're basically the, the customer service or the counseling arm to, as Lee mentioned, the Office of the Bursar, Office of Student Financial Aid, as well as the Office of the Registrar. So anything kind of billing, financial aid, that sort of thing is kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but we're going to touch a little bit on uh, registration as well. Uh, throughout this presentation, we're going to cover financial aid, kind of where you are right now, where your st student should be right now um, if they're planning to attend for this coming fall semester. Also the UC billing timeline, kind of what you can expect as far as uh, your student bill is concerned. And then just overall kind of student business next steps as it relates to housing, billing, financial aid, all of the above. We can go ahead and flip to the next. So the first thing we wanna go over is kind of financial aid types, what you might expect to see as aid sources to get your student bill covered. Um, and then we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into what specifically that means for your student and your, your family. So the first is scholarships. Pretty straightforward, but we're going back to the basics here. So pretty straightforward. These are typically merit-based funds that do not have to be repaid. Uh, they can be institutional, so coming directly from University of Cincinnati's financial aid office, or maybe a 
specific department within UC, um, you know, for example, the College of Arts and Sciences and maybe the biology department's giving a scholarship away or something like that. So it can be coming from UC or it can be coming from an outside organization. So uh, students, employer, community organizations, things like that. Uh, the big thing on this is that you'll want to make sure to connect with our office if you do have some outside scholarships coming in we just want to make sure that we account for all of those as we're making your uh, financial aid plan for the coming year uh, grants are a little bit different they're not generally merit-based they're typically need-based and what does that mean so based on the information that you put on your fafsa your financial need, as far as the Department of Education is concerned, your financial need is determined. And if it's determined that you, uh, you qualify, you would be awarded, your student would be awarded grants. Um, these funds are not repaid. Uh, they could be federal, state, or institutional. So pretty straightforward from the Department of, Department of Ed, from the state of Ohio, or even institutional uh, funds that are coming from UC. So again, need-based funds, have to qualify for those, they do not have to be repaid. Uh, federal work study is a little bit different. You do have to qualify based on need for this one. Uh, these are funds that do not have to be repaid and are typically earned through employment. Um, there are some opportunities with University of Cincinnati as well as some local nonprofit organizations where a student could utilize federal work study funds. It's a little bit different in that it's not applied to the bill. The student basically earns those funds through a paycheck. Um, so it's a great opportunity. You do have to qualify. There are opportunities even for students. We get this question a lot. Um, even students that don't have federal work study, there could be opportunities for them as well. Um, and we can talk one-on-one -on -one about that if your student has questions. Um, so the, the last of the list, loans. So pretty straightforward as parents, you know loans. Um, but like I said, we're kind of walking you through what you might see as the part of that financial aid award offer. Um, Loans are basically borrowed monies. They have to be repaid. We say usually after graduation because repayment will kick in if a student is uh, attending, their grace period will start if they are attending below half time. Always just something to be mindful of. Um, and if you've got questions, we always advise students to check in with our office before making adjustments to their schedule, things like that, just so we can appropriately advise them on what might happen with that financial aid. Um, so you're really gonna see a couple different areas for loans. There are subsidized, unsubsidized, and private student loans, as well as parent plus loans that are come from the Department of Education, as well as private parent loans. So there's lots of loan options. We obviously would want you to absolutely pursue the other options first, scholarships, grants, pay a portion out of pocket, work while you're in school, do a payment plan. We're gonna talk about those things in a little bit, uh, but just kind of an overview of different financial aid types. So you kind of know what to expect. Uh, we can go ahead and switch to the next one. So this screen, your student should have received, if they're an incoming student for this coming fall semester, should have received an email with this information. Um, this is your financial aid offer. Um, just want to give you the full screen. It's a little difficult to read. We're going to dive in in just a second. But this is really the place where your student's going to see uh, what they can expect to receive as far as grant funds, scholarship funds, loan funds that are available, and also the cost. So I know we have a lot of families that, that want to check in about, okay, what exactly am I expected to pay? What is that going to look like? This right here is a really good estimate of what you can expect before that official bill becomes available after registration. Uh, Tiana, we can flip to the next. So the top portion of the screen that you're seeing, I hope that's a little easier for everybody, but basically what this is showing you is this student here has a federal Pell Grant, um, has an estimated scholarship from the College of Education um, and some loans, and then it also starts to dive into that cost of attendance. So they're estimating that the student is living on campus as well as their full-time tuition and fees. So it's showing here's direct cost that the student can expect to pay for this academic year. Also on the right side of the screen, you're gonna see little videos that kind of walk you through, they're fun and engaging, that walk you through uh, different topics. So what in the world is cost of attendance? What does that mean? Um, it's basically just the cost that it is to attend. Uh, your direct cost are costs that are directly on your student bill, things that were directly billing to you. Um, indirect costs could be things like books. Some are not on your student bill, those do have to be covered and paid for uh, as a part of your education, right? Uh, so there are some direct and indirect costs, but it really kind of breaks all those things down for you. So if you haven't, take a look at this. This is a good resource. Um, let's flip to the next screen and we'll look at the bottom of that award offer. So again, kind of breaking down that indirect cost, again, transportation, you're probably gonna need to drive. Are you commuting? Are you attending online? Is it a mix? 
What does that look like? And then it also is kind of outlining for you, again, those options for paying for college. So a payment plan, always something we can look at, uh, parent plus loan, and then any other non-federal loan. So basically what they're saying is, hey, from here, we've given you some scholarships, we've given you some grants, you still have some costs that need to be covered. So what does that look like for you? And that's the biggest thing that we want you to take away today is to make sure that you've got options, you've got support here to help you find what those other options might be. We can flip to the next. Okay, so kind of a quick to-do list that we wanna walk through. Some of these your student has probably already done or at least started um, for the coming academic year, but we wanna walk through each of them just so you kind of know what to expect. Um, we wanna make sure that students are reviewing and accepting financial aid in Catalyst. Um, in Catalyst, it's a student portal. Um, students are gonna have a tasks tile. We wanna make sure students are aware of that. They complete any necessary items that are on there as soon as possible, because uh, many of those items do have financial implications. So we wanna make sure that those things are done so that the bill can process, student can register, and uh, the financial aid can process. So keep that in mind. Um, verification, we can dive a little deeper into that if you have specific questions, but it's basically just a process that some students are selected for to provide additional documentation. So again, get that tasks tile completed. Make sure you help your student get those items cleared away as quickly as possible. At UC, student health insurance is automatically uh, charged um, if you do not waive it. So if you have other coverage, we wanna make sure that you waive that student health insurance So make sure you, you stay on your student about taking care of that. Um, we have a, a financial agreement at UC that'll also be on that tasks tile. Um, basically what it says, just an agreement that, uh, that you're registering for classes, there's a bill and the bill will need to be paid. So we wanna make sure that gets completed. Um, if you're expecting a refund from us, we wanna make sure that you enroll in direct deposit. Um, so help your student with that. Uh, basically, just like it sounds like how you might have direct deposit at your employer for payroll, we do the same thing uh, for students who are expecting a refund. That's the way that you would use that financial aid money to then pay for some of those indirect costs. So things like books or um, transportation, you've got a gas to get back and forth to campus. Um, that's how you can use that financial aid money to then pay for those things. Um, complete the financial aid authorization. Basically just authorizing that we can use that financial aid to pay for some of those additional fees, as well as delegated access. So I wanna spend a second to talk about this one. So delegated access as the parents helping the student, uh, delegated access is basically your access to the student's information in Catalyst. So if your student hasn't done this already, um, especially the fact that you're here, I'm sure that means that you're gonna be helping them get questions answered. Uh, make sure that they sign you up for delegated access. You're gonna get your own uh, username and password if you haven't done this already, uh, they definitely can go ahead and make those steps. Uh, and then you'll be able to get in and you'll have viewing rights to see whatever they delegate access to. So if you've got questions on that process, our office can help with that as well. We could flip to the next. Um, so this is my last slide and then I'm going to kick it to our next presenter. Um, just want to do kind of a high level overview of what to expect as far as registration. Um, so in order for the bill and the financial aid and all the things that we've talked about to process, the student has to get registered. So how does that work? Um, your student will first attend orientation. Um, those have started uh, for uptown students and will start very soon for our other locations. Um, the student will need to attend orientation. They'll also need to meet with their academic advisor. Um, any concerns that the student might have about uh, transfer credit and things like that, all those things coming in, um, the advisor is the best person to talk to about that. Um, and then from there, they'll be able to get registered. Um, now we touched on this, but just wanna make sure to remind that we always advise students to check in with us before making changes to their schedule, dropping classes, um, you know, adding classes, that sort of thing that's gonna uh, change the student from part-time to full-time, uh, just so they know what to expect as far as billing and financial aid is concerned. Um, so it's pretty much it for my spiel. As Whitney mentioned, if you've got questions, we can cover those at the end. And from here, I will go ahead and kick it back over to Tiana to cover some housing information. You're on mute. I knew I was going to do that, and I did. Um, again, my name is Tiana Christman from um, University Housing, and I want to give a brief overview of the housing application process. 
this process um, happens over three distinct phases. So, so uh, phase one, when the application opened back on March 1st, um, that was just the, we collected some general information from your students. They expressed if they had any interest in any of our living learning communities. They had the ability to start the uh, roommate group process and create roommate profiles, as well as pay the, the application fee. Then phase two, which we're actually currently in phase two, um, really kind of begins really um, early June and it will run through July and that is actual the room selection process where your students go back into the house application and physically pick the room that they'll be living in for fall. And then phase three culminates at the end of the summer um, ahead of move in and that's where our students one more time go back to the housing portal back into that uh, fall housing application and they set up an appointment um, to move into our residence hall. Because where are we now? Because we're actively in phase two, I wanna spend a little bit more time and kind of dig into um, what happens during phase two. So the room selection time plots um, typically go out late May, early June. However, I actually sent those out today. And so everyone who had completed all of the necessary steps, um, their students should have in their UC email, um, their room selection time slot. They can also log right back into the housing portal. Um, and once they get logged in on the landing page, if they've been uh, assigned a room selection time slot, they will be, will be able to see that right in the portal. So um, this was, uh, we were a little bit ahead of schedule. We were excited to go ahead and get them out. We have been getting calls and hearing from both um, parents and students, a lot of anxiety participation around the room selection time slot. So we were able to uh, wrap that process up and sent out that first batch for everyone who had done everything that they needed to went out today. Students must have paid the application fee um, unless they have a waiver of some sort, registered for a uh, BBO, Bearcat Bound Orientation ses Session. That's for the coming freshmen. There is a little bit of a different process for transfer students, so they're not required to go do the traditional BBO. And the room selection time period will actually kick off next week. We'll have a, a couple of the living learning communities and LL will go through next week. And then the following week, um, all of the general population will go through the room selection process. So if they are not in an LLC, um, they'll go through the room selection process beginning, I believe that is June 1 is the earliest spot for the general selection. If your students have not already done so, I highly recommend that they go to the housing website and there are process videos available for them to see what the room selection process looks like. It takes them through step by step, screen by screen, exactly what they'll see on screen as they're going through. So I uh, recommend encourage your students to take some time to take a look at those videos before their time slot opens up because they don't want to waste unnecessarily unnecessary time once their time slot opens calling us um, looking for assistance. When we want to talk about a little bit more about room types and the rate. So we want to tie into the monies matters conversation. You want to think about where your students are living and where they live room type that they have really kind of dictates what their price will be. So our residence halls basically fall into three overall broad categories for room types. It will be the traditional hall. That's going to be Dabney, Daniel, Sadal, and Calhoun. There's an asterisk there next to Calhoun because it is currently um, down. It's currently put the gates up this, this week, actually, um, to begin the renovation project on Cal, um, Calhoun. So it will not be available for this upcoming school year, but it, it will remain a traditional hall. Your traditional residence halls will be your halls that have a communal bathroom for the entire floor, and they're gonna be gendered by floor. So every other floor um, will be opposite gender. So the next midpoint will be your suites and junior suites. So these have multiple um, inside of those residence halls. Uh, you can have a, a private 
bedroom or multiple students in one bedroom. The big difference with your suites um, compared traditional residence halls, there's no communal bathroom. So the bathroom will only be shared amongst the suites, your suite mates. And that will be CRC, Marion Spencer, Schneider, uh, Stratford Heights, and Turner Hall. And then finally, um, there's the apartments. And that's just as it is. It's an apartment. It has an in-unit kitchen, in-unit bathroom um, for your students. And that can they have both uh, single occupancy bedrooms as well as multiple occupancy bedrooms across the um, apartment portfolio. Our apartment locations are going to be Corey, Deacon, Eden, Morgan Sayoto, U Square, um, University Edge, and UPA. When trying to determine your rates for your specific room, um, you want to make sure that your student is clicking on their um, cohort. So everyone who's coming in for the fall, so all of our fall admits will be part of the 2021-22 cohort. I'll give you a second if you wanna do a screen capture because I'm gonna take you to a um, QR code that will take you directly to our website where you can find those rates. And I'm sharing my screen, so it's going to take just a second for it to load. All right. So when you uh, click on the uh, QR code, it, again, it will take you directly to um, the 21-22 cohort, which will indicate your page, um, your rates for your uh, student. With, the, our housing rates are also part of your tuition guarantee. So the rates that you see um, for each room type will be the rate that carries to your, with your student. Um, that rate will be the same as long as they remain in the same room type. If they upgrade, um, say they go from a traditional to a suite or a suite to an apartment, you'll still pay the 21-22 rate, but you'll pay it for the room type that your student has upgraded to, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll take a look at how to read the information here. So the roommates are broken down by the room type. So we'll start off at the base rate for our traditional halls. Um, again, Dabney Daniels uh, Sadov with Calhoun offline. You'll have two options within the traditional halls. They're going to be that's going to be multiple occupancy. When we talk about occupancy, remember we're referring to the bedroom or the sleeping quarters. Are, are there, is there one person in there or are there multiple? So for multiple, there's no difference between two students in a room or three students in the room. We just have multiple occupancy, basically, are, is there more than one? Um, and that per semester rate will be listed here, the 3653. If your student is in a traditional hall and they have a bedroom that is single occupancy, it's going to be the 42, uh, 42 well, for the semester and then your uh, per year rate is also listed. Again, that same layout is listed for all of our suites and junior suites. There is a little bit of a price difference between the junior suite and the full suite. The full suite gives you a little bit more room. There's a small um, communal sitting area. I wouldn't call it a full living room, but it is a common area within the suite um, that the students share. The junior suites do not have the communal area inside the suite. And again, it's multiple occupancy. How many are in the sleeping quarters? Um, one student or more than one. And that's how you will differentiate between your rates. I'm going to kick it back over to my colleagues now. Hi, once again, my name is Lee Jackson. I am the, the bursar at University of, University of Cincinnati. I'm going to talk through some of the things you should expect in terms of your student bill. So um, unlike financial aid, which, you know, at this point, a student should have their financial aid award. If they don't, definitely have them reach out to our one-stop team to figure out where they are in that process and, and whether they might need to, to do some other things uh, to make sure they get their financial aid award. If you don't have a bill right now, that's okay. Nobody does for fall. Uh, fall bills will be available in Catalyst uh, in the student portal in mid-July. 
that's when we'll first start to, to release student bills. At UC, we do not mail a paper bill. So um, the student will access the bill online. They can get a PDF version of it that they can print out if you want to print copy for your records, um, or they can just view the, the bill online in the portal. Um, so those will be available in mid-July. Um, your financial aid will not disperse until August 13th. So that's the first day that the federal government allows us to disperse any federal financial aid and post it to your bill. Um, so we will post all of your aid at the same time, uh, as long as you've made sure to take care of all the checklist items that Sydney talked about earlier that might relate to your financial aid. Uh, if your student's borrowing a loan, they've got to make sure to do their entrance counseling and their promissory note and all those sorts of extra steps that go into the financial aid process the, the first time they go through it. Um, once the financial aid posts to the bill, if your student has um, more financial aid than they need to pay their direct costs, then we'll send them a refund. Um, and those will actually start to go out again on August 13th. So the day we post funds, we'll start to get those student expense uh, refunds out to students so they can buy their books, they can take care of all of their uh, other items that they wanna take care of before classes start. Uh, the bill will be due August 18th. It's always gonna be due five days before the term starts. Um, and then classes will begin on August 23rd. So our bills are due five days before the, the term starts. That doesn't mean you'll start to get non-payment penalties five days before the, the school starts. I know this is a very common question among our, especially our first year students, our first time students who maybe are a little unfamiliar with the financial aid process. Um, and so it might take them a little longer to take care of things. That's okay, this first, uh, first semester. Um, for fall semester charges, you won't actually see late payment penalties in the terms of late fees until the end of September. So we give you what we hope is adequate time to get all of those things taken care of before we start to tack on late fees. We do add late fees that you see if the bill goes unpaid beyond that time though. So you are actually the first people who have seen the expected tuition rates, uh, at least outside of my office, uh, for the upcoming school year. Um, so these will be uh, just like the housing uh, that Tiana mentioned earlier. At UC, we've got a tuition guarantee, which means that as long as your student stays on track and finishes their program within the time allotted. So if they're in a four-year program, if they finish it in four years, or a five-year program that they finish in five, they won't see a tuition increase. So um, this tuition rate, I'll be frank, is higher than last year's cohort paid. And you, all that information is on the public website. You can see that. But this is the rate that you'll lock in for your student for the full four-year duration of their, their time at UC as undergraduate students. Um, the example that I've shown or the, the numbers that I'm showing on the screen right there are for our standard programs at our three campuses. Uh, it's the full-time rate um, and it is the per semester rate. So this would be what you see on your bill for fall semester and then you'll get another bill for spring semester uh, when your student enrolls for spring. What I'm showing doesn't include other fees that a student might have. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the other things that will potentially be on a student bill um, a little later on. So program fees, if you're an out-of-state family, it doesn't show your out-of-state fees. Other charges that might be on the bill are not, not included here. Um, and just so you know, th this is, we're calling these the expected tuition rates because the Board of Trustees has not approved this rate structure yet for the upcoming school year. We expect them to do that uh, toward the end of June. Hey, Tiana. Thanks. Um, so I, I said there are other things that can impact your bill. What are some of those impacts? And there are actually quite a few of them. So which tuition guarantee cohort is the student in? Um, so if they're a 2021 student, they're going to have a different rate structure than a student in 21-22. Um, there are some academic programs that you see that have, uh, we call them special fee programs. Probably doesn't feel so special because they're usually higher than the standard rate. But there are some programs that have a different rate structure. We publish all those on our website. Uh, so once the, the 21, 22 um, fees are published, you'll be able to see those, uh, the tuition guarantee rates for any special fee program that the student might be in. Um, for undergraduate students, most of our students are in standard rate programs as far as the, the base tuition and fees go. Um, but some of our academic programs have what is called a program fee, which is a separate fee on top of the tuition that I showed you on the last slide. So students in CCM have a program fee, students in the College of Business have a program fee. So uh, you might see one of those on a student bill based on which program the student is in. And again, um, all of those rates are published on our website, um, uc.edu slash and you can see what 
uh, all of those different rates might be. Whether you're an in-state or out-of-state student has a big impact on your tuition bill. You know, at the University of Cincinnati, we're a state school, so we receive a state subsidy um, from the state of Ohio for our in-state students that we don't receive for out-of-state students that enroll. So out-of-state students do have to pay a higher tuition rate in terms of, uh, we call it a non-resident surcharge on the bill. It's kind of a, a large title for uh, the, the fee is basically just your out-of-state fee. There's several different categories of non-resident students though at UC. Um, so there are students that receive reciprocity in certain programs, um, which actually they pay the in-state rate even though they're out-of-state students. There are also some students that pay a very reduced uh, metro rate for out as an out-of-state student. Uh, so you'll wanna make sure that you review the registrar web pages that talk about those different residency classifications if you think you might meet either reciprocity or metro requirements um, and take care of all the steps needed uh, to make sure that you are completing all the paperwork the registrar wants to see to determine that yes, you can get that reduced out-of-state rate. And if you don't qualify for one of those other two, then you pay the, the standard non-resident rate. Uh, at UC, we bill based on credit hours up to 12 for undergraduate students. So a student taking six hours would pay more than a student taking three hours, but less than a student taking nine. But once you get to 12 hours, we consider you full-time for tuition. And from 12 to 18 hours, a student pays a flat rate. So even though 12 hours is full-time, we definitely encourage students to take more hours if they can manage it. Um, your student will hear a slogan at UC called 15 to finish periodically. Um, if a student takes 15 credit hours each semester, they're gonna finish in that four-year time frame uh, that they would expect to finish in. And that'll save them money in the long run so they don't have to come back for a ninth semester to pick up uh, some classes that they missed by taking 12 hours. Most first year students don't co-op, but when a student is on co-op, they pay a very reduced rate. So whether students on co-op or not will determine or will have uh, impact on their student bill. Um, I mentioned we've got a flat fee between 12 and 18 hours, but if a student takes more than 18, then they'll have what we call an overload charge. So they'll start to pay an extra per credit rate. Um, so a student taking 19 hours would pay the full-time rate plus the per credit rate for one hour. Tiana walked through the different housing options that students have at UC and there are a lot of them and they all have different rates. So uh, which housing uh, your student decides to live in is gonna have an impact on how much the bill is. Whether or not they choose to have a uh, student parking, you know, if the student has a car on campus and they wanna have a parking pass, uh, that parking pass will get added to the student bill at UC. Uh, so it'll be taken care of. And as long as they've taken care of that financial aid authorization, their financial aid can pay that charge. Um, so if they select house or a parking uh, pass, then that will go on their student bill as well. Uh, other things you might see on there, things like eBooks. Um, Sydney mentioned that some courses, when the student signs up for the class, they get an electronic book as just part of the course. They don't have to buy the book separately at the bookstore, but there is an additional charge for that eBook in most cases, and that'll be on the student bill. Uh, not listed here, but if the student has student health insurance, that's a, a very common one, um, that if, you, if the student doesn't waive the health insurance or can't waive it, uh, then um, that charge will be on the student bill as well. Next slide. So we talked about financial aid coming in, paying the fees, issuing a refund of the student. So what happens if you're in a situation where the financial aid that you've accepted doesn't cover the bill? So there are a lot of different options uh, that families have. Um, one is that, you know, if you've had savings and you're, you're ready to just pay out of pocket, you can make a personal payment. We accept online payments. Um, if you pay online via an e-check, there's no additional cost to that because there's no additional cost to UC. But if you do pay with a credit card, there is an additional credit card service fee that's charged at 2.75%. Um, you can pay in person. Um, this is sometimes a little frustrating for families though, uh, to be honest with you. You can't pay in person and get a receipt from someone. So we do have a drop box on each of our campuses but we used to have a cashier's window that frankly didn't get used enough to justify keeping it open. And so we closed it. But if you do have, if you're on campus and you wanna drop a check off, you can do that and we'll get it processed and posted to your bill. Um, or you can, you can mail a check to us. Um, one thing to keep in mind, the website that, or the address you'll see online uh, for where to mail your payment says Cleveland, Ohio. And that is correct. We have a, a payment processor that happens to be located in Cleveland. So you'll send your payment to the University of Cincinnati in Cleveland, Ohio, if you, if you wanna mail a check. Um, a lot of families use 529 plans or other college savings plans uh, to pay the additional costs that aren't covered by financial aid. 
And those, um, we don't have a lot of general instructions because those are gonna be very specific to your institution that you've got your plan through. So if you're planning to use one of those, start to talk to them now about what kind of time frame uh, you need to submit your request for payment in order to make sure that the bill is paid um, in a timely fashion at UC. Some can turn the payments around, we found in a few days, some processors take a couple of weeks to, to from their point of request to actually getting a check in the mail. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're working with your provider to make sure that that gets taken care of. We do offer a tuition payment plan at UC. Um, we have, if you wanna take your out-of-pocket payment and stretch it over three payments um, in August, September, and October for fall, you can do that. There is a $35 fee to do that, but it'll avoid any kind of late payment penalties, uh, no service holds for your student, no late fees, um, and allow you to make the, the payments in three even installments. If you sign up for a payment plan also, and then you have additional financial aid that comes in and posts, that payment plan will automatically adjust for you. You don't need to, to contact us or anything like that. So uh, that is one benefit of the payment plan uh, as well. And then if you are at the point where um, you choose to borrow to help finance your, your uh, college education, you've got a lot of options there too. Um, so one of them that the financial aid office um, has hopefully uh, communicated with you about is a parent plus loan. Um, this one is confusing because it is the parent that's borrowing it and it's the parent that's responsible for paying it back. Um, and it's not deferred while the student's in school automatically, but can be if, if you choose to do that. Um, but there are also a lot of student loan options on the private loan market. So there are private student loans. Um, right now, interest rates on loans are, are really good. So we're seeing families make this choice uh, to, to take a relatively low interest private student loan. Um, or there are even private parent loans that sometimes have uh, interest rates that are competitive with or even better than the federal parent plus loan. So I would definitely encourage you before you borrow a parent plus loan, uh, a federal plus loan, to go ahead and take a look at some of the private parent loan options. Maybe one of those would be better for you um, if you're thinking about doing a parent loan for borrowing. Thanks, Tiana. Okay, so your next steps, um, in addition to the, the, the items that Sydney mentioned earlier, you know, the student should be keeping an eye on their to-do list and catalyst. They should um, watch for emails from our different offices, letting them know that so certain tasks can be done. Um, Make sure that if your student hasn't filed a FAFSA, that they do so. It's not too late. Um, you can still file your FAFSA, and that will give our aid office plenty of time to get a financial aid package together um, in, in before fall starts. There's also a scholarship search tool uh, within Catalyst that your student will have access to. If you know they were offered some scholarships, but you think they might be able to qualify for more, uh, it's connected to a, a rather large database of scholarship options, so they can start to look through, through those um, and see what there is potentially um, remind your students, again, to, to look at their items on their task tile. That is really how UC is going to do most of our communication with students about what they need to do. Most offices use that to-do list to let students know that they've got something that needs to be done. Um, make a plan. If you feel overwhelmed by all this information, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed, I'm sure, um, give our one-stop folks a call. They'll be happy to either schedule an appointment with you or um, just take a, a call um, without an appointment and take a look at your financial aid, take a look at your students' individual costs based on their program, based on their residency, help you figure out what the gap is and talk through the options at length with you so that you, you can feel comfortable that you're making the best choices for your family's finances. Um, and then it feels like it's really early to think about next year's financial aid, but that process starts really early. So uh, make a note on your calendar, 2022-23 FAFSA will open on October 1st, and we definitely encourage you to, to file as early as possible. All right, thanks so much, Sydney, Tiana, and Lee for sharing some information today with families. We're gonna jump into your questions in just a couple minutes. First, I wanted to share with you an upcoming event that we're gonna be having. Um, so today's conversation is really around how are we planning to pay for college? How do we understand what it costs to attend UC and all of the different aspects of what that looks like? But the next part of the conversation is really around finances and money matters while your student is here at UC. What does it look like as a new student in college on your own for the first time perhaps um, working um, at college, you know, how do they learn about money management and budgeting? So everything that we do as a university to support your student 
from a money management standpoint, as well as how we can work together with you as the family to support your students. We have all kinds of resources here with you. So that's really the next step in this conversation. So I wanna share that date with you here first. Um, so that'll be on Wednesday, June 30th at 10 a.m. We'll share that information with you the same way that we shared this. Um, so you'll be able to find that link as we get closer to that date, but please join us to learn more about helping your student get ready to prepare for the financial aspects of being in college. And then um, if you wanna go on to the next slide, Tiana, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Diamond, and then we'll get started with some of your questions. All right, thanks, Whitney. Now we'll go ahead and have a little Q and A. Um, also, I'd like to say if you wanna go ahead and like screenshot, um, this page or take a photo so that you can have our contact information. If you do want to reach out to us at any time, any one of our offices with your additional questions and concerns. And go ahead now at this time, please feel free to put those questions into the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and start answering some of those. Um, we just kind of also like to remind you know, families to just you know only ask like general questions. Don't disclose any private any information or anything about your student you know, in this space but we are happy to go ahead and answer questions at this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with some of the questions that came in throughout the presentation. One of the questions is, will we be sharing the recording of this event? And yes, we will be sharing it. Um, we also will make sure that we share um, all of the relevant links that were posted in the chat. So you'll be able to get that later. Um, so if uh, for some reason you can't find it later, we will post it on our Facebook as well as posting where you uh, found this in our family portal. Um, you're always welcome to email us at families at uc.edu and we can get you that. All right, so first question, uh, Lee, talk about out-of-state tuition briefly. Sure, so um, out-of-state tuition at UC, I'll be honest, is it's pretty high. Um, it's in line with the other state schools in the state of Ohio for the most part. Um, but as I mentioned a little bit in the, in the presentation, essentially the state of Ohio provides a subsidy for in-state students that enroll at UC to help us keep their direct costs down that they don't provide to out-of-state students. And so um, we are required by the state of Ohio to charge an additional out-of-state fee to students. Um, so we do have a, a number of students that pay the full out-of-state fee, but we also have a lot that qualify for the, the metro rate. Um, so students that live in the state of Kentucky or a good number of, of uh, counties in the state of Indiana can qualify for the metro rate, which is essentially the in-state rate plus about $360 a, a semester, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's, it's very much reduced from the 7,000 or so that a, a full out-of-state uh, student would pay. Um, but I also I mentioned reciprocity as an option for certain programs for students in certain counties in Indiana and Kentucky. Um, that's much, much less common. Uh, but if a student is in that situation, they definitely want to take advantage of that, that program. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question. What's the difference between Uptown, Blue Ash and Claremont campuses? Um, so Uptown is our large um, campus. Um, that many of you have probably visited here in downtown Cincinnati in the Clifton neighborhood. Um, Blue Ash and Claremont are our regional campuses that are located in the Blue Ash um, area of Cincinnati and also in Claremont County, which is east of Cincinnati itself. So um, probably most of you, if you um, are, you know, having sort of the traditional um, so-called um, student experience and you're thinking of the campus where the football stadium is and all of that, that's our Clifton campus. All right, so let's move on. Um, we've got a couple of Cincinnati questions. So um, can you expand on the 30 hour community service requirement and also do they have to have the scholarship for eight consecutive semesters and what happens if they take a co-op? Sure, yeah, I can talk about that. So Cincinnati, um, you get eight semesters of eligibility, but no, they do not have to be consecutive. So if obviously there are students who receive Cincinnati who will co-op um, or maybe they'll co-op in the spring and take classes in the summer, we can absolutely make those adjustments, not a problem. Um, a student can't receive a scholarship while on co-op, so that additional 
uh, semester of eligibility would just move to the next time that the student is taking classes. Uh, so generally speaking, we know with our students who co-op, sometimes it's more like a five-year program. Um, so usually they don't have any issues uh, using up all eight semesters of eligibility. But um, again, you know, we can talk about that one-on-one -on -one with your student if they have specific concerns. Um, now with regard to the community service, um, Basically, and I, I think I know kind of what they're getting at, but if they have, if this person has an additional question, feel free to drop it in the chat if this does not answer it. But um, there is a 30, uh, a 30 hour per year community service requirement to maintain the scholarship. Um, there are lots of opportunities, however, that the student can complete those remotely. So a good place to look for those opportunities are with the university's Center for Community Engagement. Um, they've got a portal, essentially. Everybody's got a portal, right? A, a portal, essentially, where they can go in and look for those opportunities and then choose the things that best align with what they want to do. Um, but the requirement is there. Uh, so they do need to get those completed in order to maintain that scholarship. Um, I think some remote opportunities are things like... Uh, uh, like remote tutoring or something like that. Um, and, and you can find all the details. I think uh, Whitney's dropping those in the chat. Uh, you can find all the details and in, in ins and outs of the, the policies and things like that for the scholarship. Uh, but ultimately those do need to be completed each academic year. Does that help? If it doesn't, drop us your additional questions in the chat. We can make sure to address those. Was that on Cincinnati? Yes. Um, and then are there still scholarships to apply for if the student is starting in fall 2021 and where can we find those? Sure. So Lee kind of touched on this. Um, there are scholarship opportunities always. The best place to start is with the student scholarship search tile in Catalyst. So just like we mentioned, there's a tasks tile. You're going to see a bunch of boxes. There's one that's scholarship search. So students always have access to that. Um, there are some additional resources on our one-stop website that outline some reputable search engines. Um, we always tell students, please do not pay for scholarship searches. Um, so we will drop that link in the chat for you as well. Um, some additional resources on the one-stop website. Uh, but yes, there are opportunities. Uh, so definitely take a look and see what's out there. Uh, there may not be a ton for this fall semester, um, but there may be some that are out there for the, the spring of 22 and beyond. So check those out for sure. Thank you. Um, lots of questions on waiving student health insurance. So I'm going to put that link in the chat. Um, so if everybody um, can take a look at that, um, that will be where you'll find all the deadlines for that and the process for waiving out of student health insurance. And, and Wendy, I will add, um, that's one of the items that a student can't do yet. Um, it's sort of a quirk of our um, student health insurance provider that they can only accept waivers from one year at a time. So we have to get through our summer waiver process before we can start waiving for fall. But you should be able to go online and complete that waiver process beginning June 1st. That's, that's the target date that they have to release the, the fall. And then I'll give you six weeks to complete that process before we send you a bill. Thank you, Lee. That's an important clarification. And I'm about to also drop a link in chat that has scholarship information so you can grab that as well. All right, next question. next question. Can direct deposit be set up to go to the parent's bank account versus the students? Yes, yeah, so we've got, we actually have lots of options. So if you, if you choose to borrow a parent plus loan and a portion of the refund that gets sent to the student is from the plus loan, um, then we'll actually send the parent the refund rather than the student. However, the parent wants to receive that either by check or by direct deposit. So a parent can have through delegated access set up um, direct deposit for themselves. Um, but they, we also, we don't have any controls over what bank account a student uses. They can choose whatever bank account they want. So if it's their own personal account, they can put that in and have their refunds go to that. Or they can put uh, parents, they can put grandmas if they're feeling generous. Um, it really, it doesn't matter to us who they're, they're they're putting in as their bank account information. Um, so yeah, you can have that conversation with your student if you wanna help them manage their money the first year and have the refunds come to you so that you know, you know that they've made sure to space out their expense money over the course of the semester. A lot of families choose to do that. Thank you. All right, next up, will orientation be virtual or in-person? So this year, orientation has uh, both virtual and in-person components. So students will first attend a virtual 
um, session and then later in the summer an in-person session. So I'll drop some information here in the chat as well about orientation and your students go into the portal and, and get signed up for a time slot. All right, um, when a student is on co-op away from Cincinnati, do they pay for housing and tuition? Um, I'll take the housing piece. No, our housing contract is um, aligned with the university's philosophy and, how, and understanding how important the co-ops are. So we um, allow students to be released for co-op semesters from their housing contract. What they'll need to do is um, send to UC Housing, um, uh, UC Housing at uc.edu a copy of their co-op acceptance or offer letter. And then we will go ahead and waive their um, housing requirement for the co-op semester. And then we also put them on a list so that upon the completion of their co-op, they still get our, they are guaranteed a spot back in the housing portfolio. We can't guarantee that they will come back to the exact same room that they vacated we do guarantee that there will be a, a, a bed available for them at the conclusion of their co-op. In terms of tuition with co-op, um, for most of our co-op programs, the student will have a co-op fee, uh, but it's nowhere near as much as the standard tuition rate for a full-time student. So uh, for this year, our co-op rate for undergraduate students in engineering and DAP was $465. Um, our College of Business co-op students have uh, they're not co-op technically, they're professional experience students. They have a, a but it's very similar to co-op. They have a zero dollar uh, fee on, attached to that course. Um, a lot of our students choose to take classes while doing their co-op and particularly as UC has been offering more and more online opportunities, that's been something that um, students have taken advantage of. And in those cases, a student obviously they will get charged, but they'll get charged a part-time rate for the classes that they're taking. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that while on co-op, the student is still technically a full-time student, so they will be aid eligible for uh, many aid types. So if they need to borrow a loan to help with their living expenses, if they're doing a co-op in an expensive city, uh, they can get a loan to help with those expenses. Uh, if they're a Pell eligible student, their Pell grant will still post uh, for the full amount for, for co-op. And in those cases, the Pell will, in, in a lot of cases, it'll exceed the, the cost of the co-op. So um, make sure if, if your student is a co-op student, uh, when they uh, accept their financial aid award, the financial aid office is gonna ask them to let them know ahead of time if they know when they're gonna be co-oping so that they can move around pieces like the scholarship and loans and Pell Grant onto the terms that the student's eligible to receive them. Thank you. And I plugged some information about co-op into the chat. A couple of people asked, what is a co-op? So you can learn a little bit about it there. Uh, it's much like an internship, but uh, in a very innovative uh, way that's unique to UC. We actually founded co-op education here at UC, so you can learn more about it there. Um, Tiana, can you tell us what is a housing application fee? Sure, the housing application fee is $75 non-refundable. Thank you. And also, do does the housing rate that you shared include the meal plan? It does not. There's a separate rate for meal plans. Whitney, if you can, I'm going to drop the meal plan rates page in there. Yes. Yeah, exactly the uh, rate, if you go to the, uh, the page I gave you the QR code for, if you scroll down, the meal plans are actually on that same page. Meal plans are also under the tuition guarantee. So whenever you're looking at rates, again, you wanna make sure you're under the, um, looking at the appropriate um, cohort for your. All right. And um, while we're with Tiana, can you talk a little bit about um, move-in, kind of what you're anticipating? I know that plan is not completely um, set yet, but um, can you share? It is. I can tell you what I do now. Um, we still have a few moving pieces as the environment are, are changing. If I understand correctly, I think our governor actually made some announcements um, maybe today or maybe late yesterday um, that we'll be taking into consideration with the university's health officials um, and they'll help us um, 
apply the new requirements or restrictions if we still have them um, to our move-in process. So what I do know is that move-in, while we have not posted dates yet, you can start to plan that move-in will typically occur the week before classes start. I believe it's the 23rd, 24th of August classes start. And so typically move-in week, it will um, be the entire week before. Uh, we will have a move-in because we want to um, still continue. As of today, we're still um, planning to continue to social distance. And so we do have um, a sign-up process, an appointment process to sign up for your move-in. And each hall will have specific days. So for planning purposes, you can anticipate the week before classes start. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions about how much to budget for parking passes. So they have not put up the rates for fall 2021 quite yet, but they do have the rates from spring up there. So you can get a pretty good idea of what um, parking permits will cost. It does vary a little bit semester to semester and also by garage. Um, but you can see that on the website that I just posted into the um, chat. All right, next one. Um, how does someone review their financial aid package? Where would they find that? Sure, so the best place to take a look at that is in Catalyst. So at this point in Catalyst under the My Finances tile, that's where the student can review and take action on the financial aid. So that initial pretty award letter um, that's made available, you could still um, get back to that, but where you really wanna be is in Catalyst to take action on what those aid types are. So if you're already knowledgeable about what you wanna do, have a plan moving forward, we're gonna accept any free money on your behalf. So you're not gonna have to take action on scholarships grants. You're not gonna have to tell us you want those. We know you want those. Um, but if it's any loans, student loans or parent loans, uh, things like that, you'll have to take action on. So the best place to look is in Catalyst under the My Finances tile. Thank you. What banks are located on campus? Um, so at UC, we have a PNC branch uh, located in our Tangeman University Center, as well as ATMs around campus. So that's probably the most convenient if you're looking for a full service branch. Um, I think that there are a couple other banks that have ATMs around campus, um, like maybe a Fifth Third has, a, has an ATM. Do you all know of any other ones? I think there's a US bank as well. Okay. There is, and there's a fifth third bank right off of campus on Calhoun Street as well, like a full branch. Perfect. Oh, someone has a hand raised. Do you want to say your question out loud? You can do that. Maybe. It was just accidentally unmuted. Okay, so Tiana, um, I'm gonna have this be the last question for today because we're about out of time. Um, and the question is, um, can students remain on campus during holidays? Yes, we do have a option. So a couple things to consider. If your student is um, their regular permanent um, housing assignment is in one of the apartments, that their break periods are already included and calculated into their rate. So they can stay um, if they have a full apartment, there, there's no additional cost. If they're in the suites or in a traditional hall, we will have a, an option for break housing and they'll have to sign up and request the break housing. Um, and there will be a fee for that. And that fee is structured based off of their uh, cohort. It is roughly depending on your cohort, roughly about 30 to $35 per, um, per night. All right, thank you, Tiana. And thank you, Sydney, Lee, Diamond, um, all of you for joining us. Um, I am gonna suggest at this point, there were so many wonderful questions today. We didn't get to get to all of them, but I did ask this team the most commonly asked questions. So Feel free to email or call us anytime. We welcome your calls and we want to be able to answer your questions 
so that you feel ready and equipped for the fall. So please uh, make a note of the numbers. If you're not quite sure who to call, you can always reach out to our office, parent and family programs, and we can get you directed in the right way, or we'll make that information, we'll be able to help you. So thank you so much for joining. We will share this recording later. And we hope to see all of you very soon on campus, either for orientation or this fall at move-in. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.